on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program the host of Viewpoint on Current, as well as a uh, writer whose work appears in things like Slate and all over uh, the web. Uh, Elliot Spitzer, welcome to the program. Thank you. Always a pleasure to be chatting with you. So you were down in the uh, the um, uh, hearings uh, to hear Tim Geithner explain um, why regulators, well, I don't know if they did anything ever about uh, LIBOR. I guess ultimately they did, but it, they took their own sweet time. What, wh- why, what was his explanation? Well, it, it was kind of circuitous, but what it is distilled down to, and I don't want to make his case, I've obviously been critical of the Fed at many levels, and this is one more example of their failure to perform their primary job, which is to regulate the securities and financial markets, they knew that there were serious allegations of impropriety in the LIBOR market. They actually had phone calls, recorded phone calls, from people in the market giving chapter and verse of every element of criminal conduct, of bid rigging and other improper behavior. And in that context, what they did was send a memo saying, here are some ways you might improve it. But they didn't say, hey, guys, there's criminal conduct. There's market bid rigging going on. There is false reporting. They then continued to use LIBOR as the basis for the uh, debt that was issued and loans that were made by the Fed to other institutions, even as they had evidence that LIBOR itself was being manipulated. So certainly not the sort of aggressive behavior one would expect when you, you're told that the most, arguably the most single most important interest rate in the financial markets is being manipulated. So, again, look, on the one hand, I think it's a fair point that we shouldn't get distracted by blaming the regulators when the cr- overt criminal conduct was being done by the bankers. On the other hand, for those of us who've been saying that the Fed structurally needs to be reexamined and that uh, when Tim Geithner was there, the Fed was really a partner of the banks rather than their regulator. I think this is one more chapter in that in that saga. Is there, I mean, why can't the LIBOR just be a function of the, the rates that these banks got the night before? Look, there, there are so many different ways that you could come up with a number. Now, understand LIBOR is meant to be essentially the cost of capital to the banks, so that they say, look, if it costs us, and I hate to talk about arcane banking stuff, but if it costs the bank 3% to borrow, then it will lend out at something above that. It needs to make a profit. And so the, uh, one of the critical components should be its cost of capital. And this is a, me- a mechanism to determine that. So you could come up with a 100 different ways to determine their cost of capital. And in fact, before LIBOR was the base of, of most of the, of the debt 15, 20 years ago, there were other numbers that were used. Many people think LIBOR is flawed because, it, again, not get, get too technical, goes to your marginal rate rather than the average rate, so it shouldn't move all of the debt that is being issued. Put that all aside. There are a lot of different alternatives that should be and probably should, you know, could be embraced. Is it, I mean, is this indicative of just sort of the whole uh, financial, mar- or the, the, the vast amount of the financial markets basically just being rigged? I mean, it, yes. It, yes. <laughs> and, and Sam, here's what you're seeing. Once more, you have a self-regulatory process that utterly failed. And if this were the first time this story had been told, then maybe the people in the markets could say, look, somebody messed up this one time. We, we've learned. We'll move forward. The problem is, every time there has been a self-regulatory body that has been designed and charged with the obligation to oversee the structure of our capital markets, they failed. They have not lived up to their task. They have not stepped in to find the myriad violations that are there. So if, as if we needed one more message of this type, it is certainly a, a very powerful statement that self-regulation doesn't work. You know, if, for those of us who've been trying to scream from the hilltops for years, get smart guys, we're capitalists and believe in markets, but markets need to be overseen, just like you need a ref on a football field or at the Olympics, you know, the sports run because you have refs. The financial market's the only place we still say, oh, gee, we'll trust you to make your own calls. Doesn't doesn't work. And it seems to the extent that there are regulators that they're, um, they're either heavily outmatched or they are almost indistinguishable from the people that they're supposed to be regulating. Yeah, that, that, that I think is so much a part of the story, that the New York Fed emotionally was an extension of the financial services sector, that the... the and this is why, again, the issue of the board of directors of the New York Fed has on it 
the CEOs of major banks. They pick the president of the New York Fed, and until recently, it just that got changed recently, thankfully. But they control the psyche of the institution because not only the revolving door, but there is just this, they see it as a symbiotic relationship between the Fed and the banks instead of recognizing that, wait a minute, were, the, were they are not as adversaries emotionally, but adversaries in the sense of we've got to make sure that the temptation to do things that are improper doesn't override your sense of uh, obligation to the marketplace. And, and and just as I think the LIBOR story broke, there was also a piece, I think it was in the Times, about uh, essentially the front-running that's going on with uh, to between hedge, uh, hedge fund yep. managers and... Uh, you know, sort of the system of, I guess, cough twice if uh, your analyst is going right. to come out with something that's... Uh, yeah. The, look, front-running is one of the oldest games out there because, I mean, just so folks understand, if, if I know that uh, a big client of mine is going to put in a big buy order, that's going to drive the price of a stock up, if I sneak in ahead of him and buy the stock now before it moves up, then put in the order, and then sell, I get a little gain. You do it often enough, you get very, very wealthy. It's the same thing as if I know an investment bank is going to say, instead of selling that stock, you should buy it and upgrade in the analytical work that's out in the marketplace. That's going to move the stock up. I go in and buy ahead of that or sell if it's a downgrade. I'm front-running, violating all sorts of rules and obligations. But not surprisingly, it goes on, and it goes on with greater frequency than anybody wants to admit. And uh, tell me uh, what you made of uh, Sandy Weil coming out uh, last week. Essentially, I mean, it's fairly accurate to say that this guy's the grandfather of the too-big-to-fail banks, right? I mean, and now he's disowning his grandchildren? I mean, what... what? You know, I, I wish it were that simple, but it's, you know, this, you know, someday I'll have grandkids. I don't want to let them think it's simple to disown them. I don't plan to do it. But <laughs> it, this, was, this was an unbelievable moment. Sandy Weil was the one, he was one of the great deal makers of the 80s. People loved him. He's a gregarious sort. He was the one, ideologically, who said, bigger, bigger, bigger. Bigger is better. We want every bank to merge so that you're a commercial bank and an investment bank. He put Citibank and Travelers together and said, never mind that there's a law that precludes it, we'll get Congress to repeal that law. And the financial services industry was so strong, they did. They repealed Glass-Steagall. After, they did it retroactively to permit this deal to go through. It was kind of a remarkable parable of how and where the power was. Now, all these years later, he's saying, oops, it didn't work so well. And on the one hand, you want to say, congratulations for the intellectual integrity that you you know, are showing in, in recognizing this and acknowledging the error, and that is important because I think it now leaves the few folks out there who are still justifying those mergers kind of w- with no friends left. On the other hand, you want to say, man, you're responsible for some really grievous, horrendous stuff. I mean, think what has happened to our economy to a great extent because we completely deregulated financial services. We let this ugly stuff happen. It has destroyed. These bubbles have destroyed our economy. So on the one hand, yeah, Sandy disowned his kids, which are the big banks. On the other hand, uh, so you want to say congratulations, but you also want to say you were fundamentally wrong, and uh, now even you acknowledge it. Now, does Bob Rubin have to give back his salary as uh, executive vice president of uh, Citigroup, or, or is that, uh, does he get to keep no. that money? No, I, I, I think my guess is he's got it well invested. You know, look, th- this is one of the great tensions in the Democratic Party, obviously. The sort of iconic leaders who were there with President Clinton fully embraced this, uh, this move. And Bob Rubin, as you're suggesting, went over to Citibank afterwards, was the non-executive chair, I think may have been the title, got paid oodles of money. Um, and, you know, this was the ideology that it was those of us who were at the time and for years were saying, guys, this is a dangerous, dangerous path, were in the distinct minority back then, and it was screaming in the wind. Um, I think the, the history is now increasingly written and obvious that it was a grievous error. And uh, when you have Sandy Wall coming out and saying, hey, hey, yeah, not a good idea, I think the story has now been finally concluded. Do you think the Democrats have um, have in any way change their perspective on this? I mean, I don't see any evidence that there are any less um, uh, sort of, I guess, in the pockets of uh, of the big banks. I mean, I think, you know, 
Tim Geithner, um, his presence in the administration, and I think, you know, uh, and, and, and Bob Rubin's influence on the administration, he may have been there were it not for um, uh, a scandal that tied him up, I guess, in, in, in the fall of 2009 or 2008. Um, is there any indication that the, the Democrats have, have, have changed their perspective on this in any shape or, or manner? Well, I would say somewhat. I mean, not enough, obviously, but I mean, certainly with, with respect to Tim Geithner, I think not nearly enough. And, and uh, Tim was not, even when Dodd-Frank was moving through, was not a fan of the vocal rule, was not a fan of, of the necessary steps that, and positions and policies that were put in place in Dodd-Frank, some of which are good, that are uh, critically important. Barney Frank pushed a good bill. It doesn't go as far as I would like. There's something called the safe banking bill that would go farther. But I think some voices there were uh, Sherrod Brown and others were pushing uh, a, a more fundamental restructuring. So there are voices in the Democratic Party that are better. Treasury Department was not among them. And I think over time, again, that is becoming increasingly clear. I think what we've got to do now is make sure that since we're not going to get any new legislation through a Congress constituted as it is right now with, uh, with Republicans controlling the House, and as you say, the Democrats not pushing anything more vigorous, what we need to do is make sure that the vocal rule is properly and, and rigorously interpreted to at least minimize the risk from proprietary trading that can still be imposed on the system. I, I don't know if you've had a chance uh, to read the book. Obviously, you've got you read uh, the, you, you, you have a lot of people on to interview. You got to read a lot of books. I'm in the same boat. But uh, right. uh, have have uh, as um, uh, Borofsky, uh, Neil Borofsky's a book, who was the former uh, Inspector General of the TARP. Has there been any uh, revelations that you think came out of there that uh, were were new, or uh, I, I mean, uh, I mean, well, certainly some of the specifics they were, but yeah, and he, here, here's what I'd say. Neil is a, is a friend, and I think it's a spectacular book. I don't know. I think thematically, it is again additional evidence of what we knew, suspected, believed. I think he tells it. It's a great book. It's a great read. He. He, and I had him on the show uh, last week. He tells the story with a texture and with the granularity that makes it real in his personal interactions with Tim Geithner and the battles he that he waged to make the Treasury Department more and TARP, the TARP program more sympathetic to homeowners, for instance. When the Treasury Department was bailing out the banks, it did not do anything of magnitude for homeowners. And, and that was both wrong ideologically and wrong economically. The, the weight and the drag on the economy because homeowners are still burdened by too much debt that has not been probably uh, reformed is what's keeping our economy from, or at least one of the factors that's growing, keeping our economy from growing. But Neil tells the story in a spectacular way. He's a good storyteller, and he, he was there in the trenches, so I think he can bring more than an academic light to it. It seems to me that the, the big, I think, the, I mean, there were many who, who sort of suspect this from, from an outside perspective, but there seems to be almost a hostility, well, a hostility towards homeowners. I mean, when you look at HAMP and how it was designed, I mean, we all know that it was incredibly ineffective at mm -hmm. uh, providing um, uh, loan modifications for underwater homeowners, but uh, it really does, in, in, in his telling, seem less about incompetence, but in fact achieving exactly what the goal was uh, from the administration perspective, which is essentially just buy the banks more time with the hopes that somehow things will turn around. You know, I think that's right. And, and, and I try hard not to challenge motive or impute motive where there's not compelling evidence, but certainly we know that the urgency that attached to pushing money, blank checks almost, into the coffers of the banks – uh, so that their solvency would be secured. And I I'm of the school thought that we needed to do something. We couldn't let the banks go bankrupt. But the other piece of that that was ignored to, again, as I say, both ideologically and economically disastrous consequences was the plight of homeowners. And that was apparently second, third, fourth thought so far down the rung of the considerations that it was not done, not pushed, and at the moment where there was leverage over the banks because Treasury said, look, you need the money, we're giving it to you, but here are the things you must do to reform home mortgages. Once they had the bank, the banks had the money, the leverage was gone. So the failure to negotiate was a grievous tactical error. The failure to appreciate how important it was to do this was the strategic error.
Do you think that, I mean, given the chance to do it over, they would do it differently? I mean, I still get the sense that this was more, uh, this, this is, is less about sort of a, um, a good analysis of what would fix the problem and more about a, almost a, I, maybe ideology isn't uh, the right word, but almost some type of religion that this is just simply, uh, it's just not the American way to help out uh, homeowners directly. I don't know. I've got to believe they would do it differently now, if only because our economy is still, I guess, tepid is the word of the moment. I mean, we don't want to say we're in a disastrous dynamic. I mean, we're growing at about one and a half uh, uh, points the last quarter, but certainly we are in not the shape anybody wants to be in. Job growth is, is close to stagnant. We'll see Friday what uh, the, the last month's job numbers look like. But everybody acknowledges homeowners and the excess debt. There's still an enormous weight on the economy. So I've got to believe they would do it differently because it hasn't worked out. Right. All right. Well, let me ask you uh, one more question sort of off sure. of the um, – uh, this is more on your uh, former politician beat. When you right. see Mitt Romney, <laughs> I mean, I, right. I, I, I like literally every couple of days, I, I am just more and more astonished that this guy could be this bad of a politician – I mean, even almost putting aside um, his complete what what seems to be a complete lack of of policy formulations mm -hmm. for just about anything. How is Look, it this guy's he, been running for president for seven me. years and he's so bad at this? It beats me. He is, and I routinely describe him as, as the most awkward politician I've ever seen. There's just a sort of hesitancy in every interpersonal dynamic that. I'm o I almost feel embarrassed now commenting on or making fun of him because I, I say it's just kind of too icky to talk about. But, I mean, you go over to London. You're there as their guest. You're trying to you're, – you're visiting London, the home of the Olympics, our, our, our longest ally historically, and you kind of throw water in their face. It's like, whoa, come on. You don't, you don't do that just as a, as a matter of interpersonal dynamics, let alone a, a candidate. I, you, sometimes you have a hard time fathoming what gear is not turning the right way. Um, but it is it is just hard to watch sometimes. Does this guy have advisors? I mean, I don't. I mean, I don't. Like, I don't understand how this happens. I don't because it seemed like he, you know, he wasn't really. This was not a hard question that he got from Brian Williams when he did that. I mean, this was no. a, this was a, a total throwaway question. He seemed like he was hitting talking points, like he wanted to remind people of what he did, and it seems completely tone deaf. You know. It, 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 it could be that he, I mean, this is the best defense I've heard of him in, in this context. He is so coldly analytical that he cannot just give you the, the polite chit-chat answer. How do you find London and you're ready for the Olympics? Instead of saying, oh, it's wonderful, it's great, I can't wait, here's my favorite event. You know, this is good. I can't wait for the opening ceremonies, it's going to be cool. Just something that, that nobody will remember but is pleasant and, and upbeat. Instead, he's got to give you the, well, you know, I saw three things that didn't go quite right, so let's talk about them. It's like, whoa, guy, chill out. Be normal. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't get it. But uh, who am I to say? I would love to see this guy, like, being invited to a wedding and just watch him show up and just be like, <laughs> this band is horrible. Wow, I hate that gown that she's wearing. I mean, this yeah, is just... You know. This is, it's just There's unbelievable. something hard to fathom. It really something is. Something hard to fathom. Well, uh, Elliot Spitzer, uh, host of Viewpoint uh, on uh, Current, thanks so much for uh, taking the time to speak with Sam, us. Sam, always, always great to chat with you.